Hello, welcome to Pipeline Integrity. Things that make me go, hmm. This is part one of my video series. Uh, my name is Colin Scott. I'm a Pipeline Integrity Engineer based out of Calgary, Alberta, up in Canada. Today's topic is gonna to be corrosion assessment using NG18 based models. Some of you might know these models better as uh, ASME B31G or maybe uh, DNB F101. Those of you that have studied these models or particularly that done validation work will know that these models are generally accepted to be overly conservative. My estimate is that this over conservatism is probably costing the oil and gas industry somewhere between maybe three and five billion dollars per year. So today I'm going to be talking about why these models are overly conservative. Now, quick spoiler alert. The reason that these models are conservative is because they're mathematically and theoretically uh, wonky. Uh, I'm using the word wonky because some of you might be watching this video at home with small children around, but there's certainly other words that come to mind rather than wonky to describe the situation. So here's our basic NG18 equation that hopefully a lot of you are familiar with. You've got a predicted failure strength uh, divided by a flow strength, and then you've got one minus D over T, where D over T is the flaw depth ratio, the flaw depth of, of a corrosion flaw divided by the wall thickness. And then you've got one minus uh, one over M uh, D over T again. Now that M is your, your Foley's factor. And the Foley's factor is a, uh, a factor that's based largely on length. It's a function of length squared divided by diameter and wall thickness. Now this is the basic NG uh, equation that's basically been stripped down those of you that are familiar with ASME B31G or DNB F101 will know that there are different shape factors that you can put in front of those flaw depth ratios uh, to approximate either elliptical flaws or parabolic flaws. And some of you will know that there are, there are different versions of the Foley's factor or the flow strength definitions. I'm just going to keep things fairly simple now and, and hopefully you can follow along. Now typically when you're doing some model validation, it's, it's a three-step process. First, you would go and find some industry failure data. Uh, for me, I do this as a paper study, but for those of you that um, are working in, in laboratories, you can produce your own failure data. You would then use the data in your candidate model to predict the failure strength of a given corrosion flaw. And then uh, the final step would be to compare your, your true failure strength, the one that you measured in the lab or found in the paperwork like I did, you compare that to the predicted failure strength. If your model is correct, then those numbers should line up. So let's try that. I have two sets of industry failure data. One I'll call the Cronin data, and that was from a doctoral thesis from the University of Waterloo in uh, 2000. And that data set has 40 complete data sets, including some full flaw uh, profiles. Uh, we won't worry about profiles today. We'll get to that later on, though. This data is easy to find online. so feel free to do a quick web search, find that thesis, and you'll find a lot of numbers to play with if that's your style, uh, if you're a math nerd like I am. The second data set I call the Patel data, and this was prepared by the Pipeline Research Committee of the American Gas Association back in 1974. And this includes 45 data sets that would have been used to validate the original NG18 model that I'm talking about way back in 1974. That one's not quite so easy to find. Now, if you do all your math and you plot everything up, you'll find that the model is, is quite conservative. Here I've got uh, the predicted failure strength on the y-axis, I've got the measured failure strength on the x-axis, and then I've got my, my 85 data points plotted there as red circles. Now, if the model was absolutely perfectly accurate, all of those data points would fall along the, the gray dash diagonal line. Turns out that they don't, though. We've got a very few number of uh, data points that are in the upper left portion of the of the plot and these are these are data points that represent non-conservative failures so this this represents a safety concern for a pipeline operator now you'll see that most of our data points fall in the lower right portion of the plot and this is the portion that's overly conservative now it's overly conservative which means that the pipeline is safe uh, but it's really a very, very expensive way to run your pipeline. If you're a pipeline operator that spends gazillions of dollars uh, digging up sections of the pipe and doing repairs, uh, 
you're probably going to be quite concerned about this because it hits your hits your uh, checkbook quite a bit. You'll see that the trend line that I've put through there is uh, y equals 0.75x, which indicates that the model is approximately you know 30 something percent overly conservative. Now what I'm going to talk about is what I call my atypical model validation. It starts the same way. You go and find some industry failure data. The second step takes a bit of a turn. You use that data and you use your model to back calculate what would be the effective Foley's factor needed to make your model work perfectly. So you've got all the numbers you need from your data. You've got the equation. You just need to twist that equation around and, and back calculate an effective Foley's factor. Now, if you then take that back calculated Foley's factor and compare it to the theoretical, so if you compare it to the equation that you find in ASME V31G, uh, that should match up pretty well, shouldn't it? So here's our basic NG18 equation, but I've kind of twisted it and turned it around, flipped it inside out, and now I can calculate an effective Foley's factor as a function of, in this case, the actual true failure strength as opposed to before we had the predicted failure strength. So let's go through that exercise. Wow, here's a bit of a surprise. Probably a lot of people were not expecting this. On the y-axis we have the Foley's factor, and that's either the theoretical, as shown by the, the solid red curve, or the effective back-calculated Foley's factors shown by the, the red circles. Now, I don't think it takes any statistical wizardry to conclude that this is really uh, not a very good correlation. So this is, uh, this is what I mean when I say that the NG18 equation is fundamentally wonky or whatever other adjective might spring to mind. If you look at the dashed red line, that's simply a trend line that I've put through the data points and, and you can see that it has a near zero slope. So that's indicating that the, um, the model is becoming increasingly uh, more conservative as the flaw length parameter gets larger. And that's uh, going to be some concern to the pipeline operators who will be caught in a bit of a catch-22 situation. If a pipeline operator runs an inline inspection tool and finds a long flaw, the long flaw will generally be calculated to have a predicted low failure strength. But in fact, we see from this plot that for a long flaw, there's an increasing amount of conservatism built into that model. So the more likely it is that a pipeline operator feels the need to go and dig up a pipeline and do a repair job, actually the less likely that that's an accurate prediction. So that's a bit of a problem. Now I'm gonna ask you to take a look at the, the highest data points I've got there. They're at a Foley's factor of about 1.5 or 1.6. That's not important today, but it will become important in video number two. Typically, we just assume intuitively that uh, long corrosion flaws will have uh, lower failure strengths. Turns out that that's not the case, or, or really not the case for this data set anyway. Here I've plotted the remaining strength, which is the, the failure strength divided by flow strength. I've plotted that as a function of the flaw length. And uh, there really is not a clear trend. I've put a trend line through there, and, and it appears that the uh, corrosion flaws lose about 10% of their remaining strength uh, per meter of flaw length, which is really not very much. Uh, but when you look at the correlation coefficient on that, r squared of 0.04, that's really not a very reliable trend line. So what this is showing us is that although we intuitively assume that longer corrosion flaws will have lower failure strengths, that's not actually the case. That's not shown by the data or at least not shown by this data. So here we'll come to the world's best kept non-secret. This is something that people don't seem to know, although it's not a secret, and that is that the Foley's factor was originally derived to calculate the stress concentration associated with the length tip of a through wall crack. And that was to determine if it might extend axially and rupture. I think what's actually more important is the reverse of this comment in, in that the Foley's factor was not derived to calculate the stress concentration associated with the depth tip of a surface flaw. And it was never uh, derived in order to determine if a surface flaw might extend radially 
and ultimately go through while causing either a leak or a rupture. So that's something that is very, very important to think about because that's a fundamental uh, component within our NG18 equation. Essentially, we have an empirical model that has a, a theoretical portion to it that is fundamentally targeting the wrong direction. And my feeling that the reason that the NG18 equation models are always conservative is because there's, there's too much mathematical weight being put on the length of these flaws and that's uh, skewing all the numbers in the overly conservative direction. Now if you look at the various industry models we've got ASME B31G both original and modified and then the, the more refined analyses like R-Strang and, and the more recent P-squared models. We've got API 579, uh, the British Standard 7910, and then the DNBGL Recommended Practice F101. And if you look into the guts of these industry standards, you'll find that they all include some sort of mathematical form of the NG18 equation, including that Foley's length factor, but they're using it for surface flaws, which means that a lot of the uh, predictions coming out of these industry models are going to be, uh, as I said, wonky. Now, some of you will argue that uh, R-Strang and P-squared are more refined versions of the NG18 equation. Uh, you'll argue that these are much more accurate and therefore I'm, you know, I'm full of hot air here. And you might well be right. But let's remember that R-Strang uh, has uh, about a 30% over conservatism. That's reported by both uh, Cronin in his doctoral thesis and also recently by PRCI. And if you look at the accuracy of P-squared, you'll find it's about 13% overly conservative. Now, if you think about it, both of these algorithms are essentially uh, going through a series of mathematics and removing length from the calculation. My argument is that as you're removing length from the calculation, you're removing error that's associated with the basic NG18 philosophy. You're removing some of the error associated with using a Foley's factor, which is actually targeting the wrong direction. Hmm. So let's think about this. We have a, a 50 year old uh, pipeline integrity model that's composed of an empirical section and a, and a theoretical section. The theoretical section is mathematically uh, targeting the wrong direction. It's focused on Foley's factor, which has got very little, if anything, to do with surface flaws. The empirical portion of the model is what's targeting the depth, and that's what we really should be interested in. Uh, we can see from turning that model inside out that the mathematics and the industry data just flat out don't line up, and that's a problem. And I think that if you look at the failure strengths as a function of length, the correlation coefficient there demonstrates this, that there is not really a strong um, effect of length on the failure strengths. And uh, this particular model happens to have found its way into many, many industry models. Now, I have a former boss who would consider this to be uh, what he would call a suboptimal situation. The oil and gas industry is valued at something like $3 trillion worldwide, which means that it's comparable to the, the GDP of countries like uh, India and, and Britain and France. I think if you add up all the pipelines around the world, you come to something like 2 million kilometers worth of transmission pipelines when you consider both onshore and offshore lines. And then, of course, there are countless gathering lines and distribution lines and, and facilities around the world that have even more pipelines. Um, I, if you look at this NG18 equation that I've demonstrated is overly conservative and you think about how many unnecessary repairs might be done in the world, I get to the number of somewhere around three to five uh, billion dollars per year. And that's just for the oil and gas industry. I know that there are other industries that will use the API 579 models, uh, power industry, perhaps the mining industry, I'm not sure, maybe the chemical industry. And so that dollar value adds up very, very quickly. Uh, that's something that we really should uh, chew on. Now, a lot of uh, videos that you're going to find uh, on YouTube will have a disclaimer where they say this work was done by a trained professional. Do not try this at home and all sorts of safety warnings. I'm not going to do that. I would like to encourage you to try this home. Do try it. 
you've got the equations. I've shown you, you where you can find the Cronin data. Some of you might have your own data uh, because of the work that you're doing. I encourage you to try this and, and see if you find the same conclusions that I do. I feel if you put in some shape factors or play around with the flow strengths or, or if you play around with the, the theoretical model of Foley's factor, you're going to come to the same conclusion that, that I do. And uh, I have to say that only, only you can convince yourself that I'm not a total crazy person. For anybody that is serious about this, I'd like to encourage you to dig up some further reading. Um, I've got three publications based on this work. Uh, please take a look if you're interested. And thank you very much if you've made it this far. Um, I hope I've given you a few things to, to think about. Um, I've also given you the opportunity to, to check some of my mathematics against your own data, so please feel free to do that. Um, the good news behind this is that although I've, I've painted perhaps a dark picture, I do have a solution to this particular problem. Uh, you're going to have to wait until video two to learn that one. Until next time, thanks very much. Bye.